All right, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going, this is Rebecca Nichols, you can see this because my face and my name are right next to each other. Um, and I'm gonna just give folks maybe two more minutes before I start. So, um, watch in the chat box, watch in the attendees join in. Feel free to say hello and where you're, where you're at right now physically um, in the chat box so we can kind of get a sense of who's with us. And um, we were just talking about all the places in Washington to visit. So if you think we should visit you, put it in the chat box. And maybe I don't mean that literally, like Michelle and I won't come visit you after you say so, but. <laughs> And this is a webinar as opposed to a meeting. So that means that um, you can hear Michelle and I speak, but we won't be able to hear you speak. Um, so we're gonna be really relying on the chat box um, for communication, questions, comments. Michelle is going to be monitoring the chat box and I'm looking at it too, but in case I miss something, she will um, interject and let me know if there's a question or a comment. I really, um, as a trainer, I really appreciate interactive conversations, and so a webinar is not at all interactive, um, so I'm going to rely on you to use your chat box and feel free to, um, even if something I say just prompts your, a thought that you want to share, I would love to see it and hear it and share it with everybody else, um, just so that we can kind of practice that interaction even within this format. The other thing I'll say about webinars, and I'm completely guilty of this too, but um, they're hard to stay focused on because you're at your work desk and your work desk might be your dining room table today or the back patio because you want some sunshine. So um, try to limit your distractions. If you could turn your email off, turn your phone upside down if you can. Um, at the same time, we are working in unusual times. Um, that's what this webinar is all about. So. Just do what you need to do and take care of what's in front of you as much as you need to. So my name is Rebecca Nichols. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I have been working with Wixap in different capacities since 2014. Um, and I'm currently a consultant in the Portland, Oregon area. I may have met or seen um, some of you at the annual conference or at different workshops. Um, I'm really pleased to be working with Wixap and um, really appreciate setting up things like this um, so that I can just better, better know what's, out, what's going on out there in the advocacy world. And today we're going to be talking about remote supervision. And supervision is one of my, um, mm, I don't, I was going to say favorite things, but that's a lie. Supervision is really hard. So uh, it's something that I feel really comfortable with talking about, brainstorming about, acknowledging how hard and weird it is. Um, so I'm excited to have this conversation this morning. We're gonna be talking about remote supervision and how to best support the folks we supervise when we're all working in different locations. Before I jump into the content of the workshop, I wanna do a land acknowledgement. And like I said, I'm in the Portland, Oregon area and I live on the indigenous land of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, and Clackamas tribes, and there's a lot of other tribes as well that are from this area. And I really appreciate their kind of his, both historic and their present day stewardship of the land that I live on, as well as their leadership that actually spans from 9,000 years ago. That's um, the, the longest we know indigenous folks have lived in the Oregon area, all the way to now. Um, so I, in the chat box, I invite you to share a land acknowledgement where you are to the native peoples um, that are located or that are located where um, you live now or who have historically been located in that area. So, um, like I said, I've been working with WICSAP for a number of years. I've been working in the sexual and domestic violence field since the mid 1990s and I've been a supervisor for a lot of that time. And I was an executive director of our Portland area nonprofit that was a dual program for 11 and a half years. And I started to consult in 2018 with an emphasis on leadership development and vicarious trauma informed organizations. And I think as we, as our country is in a, such important critical civil rights movement right now, and we're talking more about anti-racism, I do wanna say that from my perspective, being trauma-informed also means being anti-racist because racism creates harm and creates trauma. And so when 
we're thinking about how to be trauma informed, I believe we need to really take race and racism into account because it's impacting the survivors that come into our organizations as well as the staff and volunteers who work at our organizations. So that's a, that's a big part of my framework when I'm thinking about supervision and organizational work. So we've got a couple of land acknowledgements in the chat box. Rebecca is on the land of the Duwamish and Coastal Salish people. Tara is also um, the Coastal Salish people, it looks like, in Nisqually. Thank you for sharing those land acknowledgements there. So I almost forgot that I need to share my screen. And part of that is because I don't like looking at my face while I talk, so I had hidden my face. Um, and I forgot that I was not already sharing that screen. So here we go. Okay. So if you are here to talk about remote supervision, you are in the right place. And let's get started on that. So for the next hour and a half until 11.30, we're gonna be focusing on the, these, these four different areas. And I've already talked a little bit about how trauma-informed lenses impact the way I see things. Um, and I think that part of being trauma-informed in part means to do our best to let people know what to expect. And so when I think about remote supervision, for me, expectations and communication are at the top of the list of what works. So what we're gonna be talking about during the webinar is how we can set those clear expectations. And when we are supervising people, we need to know what they're doing, you know, what work they have, how they're, how they're doing that work, any support they need. And so we're also gonna talk about how we can stay informed with other people's work performance when we how we can do solid communication across teams across our whole organizations and not just communicate but also ma maintain a connection and support in knowing that all of us are under such intense amounts of uncertainty and stress i feel like we really are taking this day by day and doing our best and part of part of that is also to ask for help when we need it and offer help as we're able to So if you're like me, um, I didn't really work from home <laughs> before. Um, I have, you know, I have a home office and what I find when I worked from home is that I wanted to fold the laundry or do the dishes or anything, anything to distract me from the work at hand. And so I feel like there's just a number of challenges that we're experiencing because of COVID and, and because of working from home. And these are just some of the things that I thought of. So first and foremost, trying to understand technology. <laughs> Before you all joined us, I was explaining to Michelle that, you know, I've got new tools at home that I need to figure out how to use. Um, and I haven't done it before. So how do I set up my second monitor and how do I manage this, you know, which screen I'm looking at and those sorts of things. And we also, some of our organizations, be, you know, in part because of VAWA and confidentiality, we didn't have access to our servers remotely or our files remotely, or we relied on paper files instead of electronic files. And so um, we're just trying to figure out, some of us are kind of got set home without a lot of tools that we might need. Another challenge that comes to mind for me is just creating a dedicated workspace. Some of us just don't have the, the possibility to do that, um, but it's, you know, but we're trying to figure that out. And especially if we're parenting or caregiving and have children in school, um, even if they're not in school and they're just trying to stay busy, we're often sharing our spaces, sometimes with partners or other family members who are also working from home. Working and caregiving is probably should have been at the top of this list. Uh, for some of us, we've got kids who have just are in the process of going back to school right now in lots of different forms. And so we really are juggling more than um, we really ever have. The lines are blurred in lots of different ways. And like I said, I wasn't working from home myself, um, not necessarily supervising people from uh, who were in other places. And so I'm really learning along with all of you because of COVID and really trying to adjust. One thing I didn't say is that as a consultant, I do interim executive director work and I have a current interim position. And so all of the things around COVID and adjusting are all, all things that are happening to me in real time as well. And then this last challenge, um, I think for personally, I continue to think about how this is impacting me. Um, 
Oh, sorry. Thank you, Erica. <laughs> I'm going to take off my earrings while I talk. Um, I like to wear dangly earrings. I like to uh, knock around things. <laughs> so blurred boundaries between work and personal life. You know, we've been doing this now for many months, and it's just occurred to me how much I needed that commute home after work. Um, just to have those that time to myself to decompress, to listen to music, to think about, you know, to transition from one thing to the other. And now I'm literally closing my laptop screen and moving into dinner preparation or um, interacting with my wife or my kid. And I have found myself feeling just a little bit punchy. I shouldn't say punchy. That's a violent way to say it. I've been feeling easily irritable. Um, and I'm just like just starting this practice of like once the work day is over, taking 10 minutes to think and to uh, be quiet and not speak. <laughs> that's, my, that's my favorite thing right now is to not have to talk to anyone. Yes, cranky. I've been feeling cranky. What other challenges are you all finding with remote, with uh, working from home? Feel free to use the chat box there. Or of these ideas, which ones are for you feeling the most um, the most present or urgent? One thing about virtual facilitation is I'm very accustomed to sitting quietly and waiting for responses. So, okay, so yes, easy to jump on your computer and work outside of work hours and Zoom fatigue. That's all happening to me too. Missing the small talk at work and connecting with coworkers informally. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that because I think that's really kind of adding up when we're just relying on phone and email. Having to banish kids to their room so that you can have a confidential conversation. Just feeling really, really spread thin, focus is on nothing because it has to be on everything. Just really connecting. And this isn't related to work necessarily, but just, um, you know, being able to hug our friends. <laughs> if you've been lucky to see your friends, that's, that's wonderful. Um, but I, you know, just, it's just such a different experience. And I think just our emotional connections have, have changed because, you know, when I do get to take a walk with a friend or something, but we don't have that hello and goodbye hug, there's just, it just feels different. It almost feels uh, less friendly in a way. And then of course, frequent, Interruptions, balancing childcare with homeschooling, <laughs> typing this while being interrupted by a child. Yes. Oh my goodness, yesterday my daughter um, was watching The Office, which I love. And like, so I had, I was on a Zoom call, the television was on. It, like, it was just way too much. So many things. Okay. So um, recently, Lori shocked from the YWCA of Clark County shared this great in, um, image with, with a group of us. And I'm gonna put the link in the chat box because if you use this link, it's a little bit better quality of a picture, but it's a PDF, so I couldn't put it into my PowerPoint. Um, so it's just a really lovely framework, I think. I'm gonna actually hang this up in the interim place that I'm working because we do still have people in the building. It's at a child advocacy center. So this whole idea that all of us are experiencing that, sometimes that experiencing COVID and, and sometimes that is really comforting to me and sometimes it's incredibly overwhelming to know that across the entire world, we're all experiencing this fear and uncertainty. So I really appreciate this graphic because it, it means to me that I can be anywhere in these circles on any given day or any given moment. And I also can move, I can move across these zones. And when I take, when I truly take a time for myself and I'm talking about five minutes, two minutes, you know, just to, to have a moment of reflection. Um, I practice yoga and meditation. So sometimes just to have a quiet little meditation that just takes a few minutes can help get me from the fear zone to the growth zone in just a matter of time. I also think that using this image helps me think about over, you know, the overstimulation of our work, our families, and um, the news and social media, and just trying to remember when I need to put all that stuff away. So things like putting my phone down, you know, at least 30 minutes, maybe even 
earlier than that before I go to sleep and just not picking it back up. That can help move me out of the fear zone into the learning or the growth zone. So I find this to be a really helpful graphic. And um, again, what feels most important to me is to recognize that both I and the people around me can move through these circles. And even if I'm spending time in the fear zone and I am complaining or I'm getting cranky or mad, that I can, you know, readjust and regulate where I'm coming from. So I find this to be really helpful. And again, we are really kind of doing this day by day and moment by moment. And so if one day is hard, you know, tomorrow you can have a different experience or a different, um, you can engage in different ways. So like I said, I think that um, it's so important right now that we are setting up clear expectations and people don't, if they don't know what to expect, then they're gonna make their best guesses. They're gonna assume they're going to um, feel uncomfortable, feel unsettled or unregulated themselves. And so these are some of the things that we're gonna talk about during the webinar. So the first one is just creating a teleworking policy if you don't already, that really outlines what employees can expect and what, what there is, responsibility of the organization is going to be. I also have been thinking a lot about um, this difference between the hours that someone works versus the tasks that they complete. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. So if somebody was typically in the office nine to five, I could sort of feel like, you know, they're working. I know that. I see them. But now I'm relying on whether or not people are getting the things done that they need to. And honestly, um, for most folks, I don't really care what, what how many hours that takes, you know, like it could take 40, it could take 27. I mean, I don't know. It's just, it's really just where the focus for me has been. Um, and then I'm going to talk about staff meetings and how we can use them as a way to try to connect. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about virtual facilitation and trying to maintain real connection with people outside of just like sharing emails and sharing business updates. So we're gonna start with this teleworking policy. So um, I, can, I can send slides to Michelle after we're done today, because um, it would probably help you to see this as a list later again. But these are some of the things um, that I think belong in a teleworking policy. Uh, the organization that I'm currently at didn't have any policy. They didn't even define essential employees um, before COVID. And so um, as a child advocacy center, they provide essential services that were open from you know, the entire time that COVID has been with us. And so we really had to scramble to, to set up what people can expect. So these are just, again, sort of my ideas around what should, be, what should belong in that policy. And if you have a teleworking policy and want to, you know, chime in using the chat box to tell us things that are in there that you don't see on this list, then that would be really helpful, I think, for everybody. So the first one is that work hours and compensation do not change. And I just was talking about hours versus tasks. <laughs> and so that sounds a little contradictive. Um, but what that means is that if somebody if somebody is getting their tasks completing and, and, and conducting their work, then their compensation is not going to change. They can expect that they're going to earn the same amount of money. I also think that while all of us are balancing many different things, it's important to let people know that if they're supposed to be working and you, if they would typically be down the, down the hall from you, that they would still be available, especially if you're operating an organization with those essential services. You know, we've, we have it um, set up <clears throat> where if, um, let's say we've got, you know, the, an assessment team in the building, and then we have an assessment team that are all working from home, doing other things. If somebody is sick um, from the team who's supposed to come into the office, everybody who's at home working is it, it knows that they might have to come in. So they're still available. Obviously, because of childcare issues, they can't always come, but that means that they're communicating that with their supervisors or they have a plan in place, a plan B. I also think that um, this can be really hard for this next point, really hard for organizations with limited funding, but that organizations do need to be able to provide all the tools that an employee would need to work from home. I'm hoping, you know, in Oregon, I don't know exactly how this is working for you all in Washington, but um, we are, through our Department of Justice, we're getting access to additional COVID dollars through our VOCA allocations that have to, you know, go to supporting people working from home. So I'm hoping you all have access to new resources if you didn't before. So that might be a laptop, it might be making sure they have internet connection. Um, it might be supporting their ergonomic needs. Uh, 
we have, you know, the organization I'm, I'm at, we've got um, kind of like a checkout process. So if somebody needs like a riser so that they can stand up at their desk at home or their table at home, then they can kind of check that out. So that means somebody in the office is responsible for knowing who has what equipment at home and we're tracking that. And then once people have all that equipment at home, it should be used for work, especially when we are talking about serving survivors, confidentiality is absolutely critical. So you need to have a policy that tells employees what's expected around not leaving things available to their, the folks who live in their home and shutting screens down before walking away so that you know, a partner can't look at an email and accidentally see a survivor's name or, you know, whatever those things are, that we are really making sure that those expectations are laid out and that we're thinking about confidentiality. And then because some of us are kind of building our home offices, um, a policy needs to say what the organization will provide. So um, the policy at our organization is that it's like basic office supplies. So again, the things that would be available to them if they were in the office, um, but just do, a, do an assessment of what you can provide and, and make sure employees know. And then it's kind of, um, I don't think it's silly to say this in the policy, but it just to state, like, if you don't know what you should be working on when you're at home, then ask, you know, if you need more tasks, then let's find more tasks or different tasks. Um, and that supervisors are also going to ask about those tasks. So, you know, being at a child advocacy center, and keep using this as an example, we've got folks who typically would always be in the office because they're doing assessments, but now they're working from home. And so if they don't have a report to complete, we actually created a list of things that just needed to get done. Some of it was creating new forms, reviewing existing policies and making recommendations to update them. Um, it just was a way for us to try to help one another stay busy when we were at home. Um, and so we use a shared drive that we can access remotely. So we have a list that all of us can look at and see what are the, you know, I don't, I don't have much to do this week because I'm on the assessment team. So what are the things that I can do? What are the projects that I can help out with? So those are my suggestions for the teleworking policy. <clears throat> So next, um, I mentioned this a couple times, but thinking about hours worked versus tasks completed. And one of the things that I'm recognizing, you know, I've been supervising for a very long time, and whenever I'm having to address a personnel issue that is kind of stumping me or frustrating me, I always feel like there's a magic fix. If I just talk with somebody and can get some good ideas, I'm just not thinking of everything. But what I'm learning is, unfortunately, there are, there are no magic fixes. So um, I think that we have to just be really clear with the folks we're supervising and recognize that things are going to work differently for the people we supervise. Like one thing that might, something that might work for one person might not work for another. And so we have to be, we have to get creative and we have to do a lot of direct communication to address things if they're coming up. So making it really normal to say, what are you working on? Um, what's the progress? How is that task going? And that I'd like to hear from you more often. I think that, you know, with some folks that you supervise, you might never have to ask these questions because they're the kind of person who's just going to tell you those things or you're just going to be in quick communication with them. I'm finding, though, that there are folks I supervise who I'm not hearing from. I'm not quite sure what they're doing. And they have jobs that um, where they have to work really independently. But again, if we were in the office together, I would see some of that stuff that's happening and we would be interacting about it all the time. And so because those things aren't happening, I'm asking these questions. Um, this is a little bit wild. My wife works for the city of Portland and she actually, on the day she works from home, she has to call her supervisor and then email her supervisor um, to say, these are the tasks I'm working on today while I'm at home. That seems like a little bit like too much. Um, at the same time, if you find that you have somebody who you just cannot track down their tasks and their projects, you might have to ask for something like that. So um, I think it's okay to say, I'm not quite sure what this person's working on, so I'm going to ask them to, you know, every week give me their kind of tasks of the week and generally when, when they might be working so that you can stay better informed. Another way that you can do this, if you have the ability to share files with each other, maybe you're using Google, Google Drives or something like this, um, is to have somebody create a task list for themselves that you can just check in on. So I have someone I supervise who does this, and, and this was her idea and it was before COVID. 
Um, but before we meet for supervision, and, and sometimes when I'm just curious, I will actually go to this list and I'll see what she's working on and she actually will document her progress. Um, so, you know, haven't done this yet or but didn't have the conversation yet or whatever those things might be. And it's been really helpful for me to just know it exists because anytime I have questions, I start there. And then because she's creating that list for herself, she's actually kind of creating her own accountability that I can just support and um, check in with her about. And like I said, different coworkers are gonna have different needs, um, different things that work for them. And so I think, you know, as a supervisor, you have sort of, I think of two options here. One is to roll with what works for each person. So I supervise about six people right now and um, each one of them has sort of a different thing that works best for them. And so I'm sort of catering it for each of those people. It does mean though, that I need to take more of my time to um, look at those lists, ask for that email and make sure I've gotten it and follow up if I haven't. Um, so that's real to take, you know, to take on kind of additional, additional steps for yourself. Um, but I also, I have the kind of style where I am gonna cater it to each individual person. Some supervisors might feel more comfortable with creating the same practice across the board. And what's good about that is if, if everyone's expected to send that email on the day they're working from home or once a week, um, then it doesn't feel like they're, you know, individuals wouldn't feel like they're being penalized um, because they're suddenly being asked for something new. However, like when I think about, I ha I'm thinking about one individual person and how I need more communication from this person. It's okay to me that she knows I need more communication from her and that she knows that I'm paying attention to what, what work she's doing or not doing. So um, I do think that it's okay to sort of cater it to the person, um, but it really does depend on your style. I'm gonna pause for a moment. I'd love if folks are willing to share um, some of the things that are either working from that for them or actually not working for them around this issue. If you've got folks you supervise who you're not quite sure what they're doing, um, what are the ways you're addressing it? Or, um, or if, if you feel like you're not addressing it, what are the things you need to be able to do that? When it looks like that um, Michelle can unmute you. I can unmute people individually, just not everybody at the same time. It doesn't let me do that. Okay. But some people so, prefer to write it in the chat. Mm -hmm. Some folks might want to um, speak and share. So just let me know. And we have both the chat box and the Q&A box. Um, so I'm just staring at the chat box right now, but I know Michelle will catch something that I miss. So we've got someone who's using Asana and Slack. We're going to talk a little bit about about that in the context of just communication between staff members. Um, one of the realities of COVID is I'm suddenly trying to learn, um, like I've become such a Zoom expert in the last six months, but, but not familiar with Slack. Um, but I know that that's been a really helpful tool for some people and can be a way for you to almost, you know, chat live with somebody. Um, you might, if you're using the, a Google suite for your communication, then you might be able to use um, chat feature there as a way to just ask questions in real time or check in with people. And I think this is especially great for folks who are doing direct service at home, because um, obviously if we were sitting together in person, coworkers would be bouncing ideas off each other or debriefing things. And so having some of these kind of live ways to communicate can be really helpful. So we've got, um, it sounds like one thing that's working for people is to kind of reassign tasks. So if someone is less busy because their job would typically have them be out more in the community, then they might be taking on new tasks that they wouldn't typically do. And I don't know what eight by eight is. It must be a phone app. I know my job is using an app called Elevate, but I have, I don't use it. <laughs> Too many apps. Okay. So um, we're going to transition into staff meetings <clears throat> and talking about that as a tool for communication. So when 
we started to transition at staff meetings, i.e. kids and cat butts. <laughs> it's helpful to see at least Michelle's face. Uh, I forgot that that was there. Um, this is what I feel like all meetings have become is kids and cat butts. Um, my kid will stand off the screen and try to make me laugh. So like people can tell which, you know, something's distracting me, but not necessarily what. And I also feel like uh, we're learning that cats love to stick their butts on a screen. <laughs> like, I feel it's become kind of just a standing joke that uh, your cat's going to walk by and jump on the desk and turn around. So um, one of the things as as we've been adjusting to, you know, we the organization that I'm at, we had this event that was supposed to happen in March and it got postponed to June, but then we couldn't have it in person. So we made it virtual. And um, I had a colleague who said virtual things are what we can plan for. And so that's what I try to keep in mind all the time is that like this, this format is what we have to work with and what we can count on right now. And so this whole idea of come as you are is been the foundation the whole time. So if coming as you are means your kids are going to be messing with you or you are going to have to come up or jump away and um, take care of something that's happening nearby. Like I, um, my dog barks every, time I'm on a zoom um, so this whole idea of like you know that stuff is happening we know it's true it's okay um, I think that setting up we're going to talk about virtual facilitation but um, setting up some expectations for folks and so you know knowing that everyone is going to come as they are how can you kind of work around that so for example if um, my daughter is talking to me I'll mute myself <laughs> you know so people don't have to hear our exchange but they can obviously see that I'm talking to someone else um, and that, that, you know, is a little bit of a distraction or I've had to take my video off and then say, I can still hear you, but I need to do something, you know, you can't see me, but I'm still listening. Um, <clears throat> so all those things are kind of the reality we're working with. I also think that when we are having this format as our, our like day-to-day -day format for the way we're meeting with each other, that making connections is really important. And I have found, you know, I really rely on the chat box during any kind of meeting. And for staff meetings, we still we still do those lovely classic um, check-in questions. And it's actually been really fun. I've, I've been challenged to think of really quick questions because it seems to take longer virtually. Um, so for example, one check-in question was, what was one of your preteen crushes? And because we're all on our computers, people were suddenly like Googling, Mine was River Phoenix. You know, I just needed to share that. But then I could like share my screen and show a picture of River Phoenix. So we were like giggling and it was just really silly and people were super engaged. Um, so finding ways to make that connection um, and to continue to keep things somewhat social or somewhat personal um, becomes really important during this time together. And then virtual facilitation, um, for me has been just another another way of facilitating and things to think about. And so um, if we were in a meeting instead of a webinar, one of the things I would have suggested is that if you um, to use the chat box and if you have a question, you can put a question mark in the box. And if you have a um, comment, then you can put an exclamation point. So when I'm doing a meeting, I have the chat box open as a separate window and I have it as close to the faces as I can so that I can see if people have questions or comments. To me, it's a little bit easier than the raise hand feature in Zoom um, and it's easy for people to do. I also, you know, if I'm meeting with people for the first time, giving them some tips around how they can rename themselves um, to add pronouns or add the organization they're at. And you do that in the upper right corner of your Zooms, of your um, picture icon. There's a little blue box. It's one of the options. Another option there is to hide self view so you don't have to see your own face. Um, and that I really, really love. Another thing I'm just, I know I'm kind of rambling Zoom things to you and I apologize, but these are things that have helped meetings go more smoothly. If somebody is going to share a screen during a Zoom meeting, then you can go to um, you can go to <clears throat> trying to see if I can do it on on this. Um, if while someone is sharing a screen, if you go to the top of your screen where there's the long black rectangle, this isn't true right now because we're in a webinar. But in a meeting, one of the options you have is to is to choose side-by-side -side view. And what that lets you do is drag open 
um, drag open the box of faces so you can see more faces and less of the person's screen. And so I do this because, um, I mean, sometimes I really am focused on what the, what the shared screen is, but like right now, it's, it would be easy to read this if you had less, less of my, my PowerPoint and more of each other's faces. And um, for me, it's just a way to, I'm still watching faces, I'm still trying to um, figure out who's paying attention or who needs something and, um, and just, you know, making it be personal. So I really have enjoyed all those different features. And I've also, I don't know, as a consultant, I get lots of training notifications for things like virtual facilitation, but there are lots of tools out there in terms of teaching, you know, learning, learning these tricks. And then Zoom actually has a ton of videos and webinars that they host too. Um, and so for me, it's just been really helpful to kind of collect these tips. However, when I am participating in someone else's meeting and we're on WebEx or we're on Microsoft Teams, I'm always like, what do I do? <laughs> I'm not sure how to use this particular format. But I'm finding that a lot of them have similar tools once you figure out where to find it. Um, so let's see. So um, somebody asked ways for hearing impaired people to be involved and connected through Zoom and looks like there's a captioning option. I know that there's also, um, I haven't used the captioning option. So if anyone's had success with that, I'd love to hear it. Um, I also know that if you need an interpreter, you can do that over Zoom, but you need to obviously connect the interpreter and the person who needs them. And Michelle, I think you all have done that as your in your advocate tour, core trainings. Can you share a little bit about how that has worked? Have you ever had you have you used interpretation? Yes, interpretation, um, spoken live interpretation is what we've used, and then they call in speak to each other uh, over the phone and then mute themselves on the Zoom. Uh, and it's been really pretty seamless. We've been looking into options about captioning in general, just because it increases the accessibility and, and just your ability to kind of pay attention, I think, on webinars and stuff like that. If you can read, you know, I notice that just when I watch TV, I use it, even mm -hmm. though like just to kind of help, especially if there's accents or anything like that, that really helps to kind of clarify. So we're looking at that option as well. And through Zoom, you can click the closed caption and then you can assign someone to type or you could type um, so that you could hire someone to do live captioning, like a cart captioner or something like that. Yeah, so lots of workarounds. Um, and one thing I'll say about Zoom, as I, I do feel like there's, because of all the Zoom bombing, the like really gross stuff that was going on when we first jumped to Zoom, there people have concerns about security. And I know that it's, it's, not, it's not completely um, foolproof of people being able to, to break in, but, but Zoom does set up a lot of things as your default. So waiting rooms are defaults now, passwords for meetings are defaults now. Um, not letting other people share screens and so like if you if you're in your own zoom account and you sometimes host meetings you can go to your settings and make it so that the default is other people can't share their screen and that you could um you have to manually change that meeting per meeting and so i have you know over over time i feel pretty confident that things are as, as safe as i can get them within within the zoom platform but it does still seem to make people nervous um, for those of you who are whose services you know need to be confidential, there is a HIPAA compliant Zoom license that you can purchase. It's more expensive. Um, I also think that Microsoft Teams is HIPAA compliant. Um, so if you're just looking for added added comfort around security, those those should exist. The one thing that I'll say about staff meetings and just being online is that. Um, I feel like things just take a little bit longer. So it seems, you know, if a meeting starts at 10, it's probably not until 10.05 that you're starting them. That's probably true in person as well. And I just don't notice it because I'm not staring. I don't see my clock right in front of me. But um, when I set an agenda up for a staff meeting, I actually am accommodating how long it'll take for people to join in. And then, that, like I said, that check-in question seems to take a long time. One thing I didn't say about when people are speaking, like when, when we do check-in questions at our staff meeting, one of the things we do is after, I, after I'm done saying whatever the, my answer to the question is, I call on someone else. And so that just keeps things moving and we're not just awkwardly waiting for someone else to speak. Um, 
and that seems to help. I've also seen people who um, set up the expectation that when you're done speaking, you say, I am complete, <laughs> as a way to signal that you're done talking before someone else talks. That seems a little bit, um, I, I haven't used that, but I've seen it happen in, in group trainings and meetings. Um, oh, I was going to say one thing about Zoom and cameras and coming as you are and kids and cat butts. I really like people to share, like to show their face. <laughs> and um, some people just are not going to, but I, I think it's okay to set up the expectation that as you're able, please let us see your face. Um, because if we were in person, we would be watching each other's faces and, and connecting in that way. Um, and so it makes me back to feeling cranky. It makes me cranky when I log into a meeting, like yesterday I had a meeting with like 50 people on it and less than 10 of us were sharing our screen. And what happens to me is I just don't think those people are really there, <laughs> you know? So um, when I can see them, I just feel a little more like we're, we're here together. Um, someone saying, Cindy's saying that um, GoToMeeting is adequately encrypted and that is a separate, GoToMeeting is a separate platform, I think. Um, also, if you're using the Google platform, one thing to know, and maybe you've noticed this already, is that when you send a calendar invite to multiple people, it auto creates a Google Meetup. And so if your meeting is really over Zoom, I have just had a, a couple instances where somebody actually clicked the go to, or excuse me, the Google Hangout instead of the Zoom link. So you can, again, manually click and delete that, that um, Google Hangout. So just another little thing to, to have to pay attention to. So any other um, questions or things to say about staff meetings? Okay. So I wanted to talk next about just how we can support one another. And I'm gonna start with this quote that I found from Michelle Sullivan. She is a philanthropist and a disability rights advocate. So I like this quote, it's finally important to help each other. No, we cannot walk in each other's shoes, but we can walk side by side and support each other. Why I like this quote is because we are all dealing with different struggles and different stresses and all of us are dealing with something. And so I can't know what you're going through. I can't know how it's impacting you, but I can do my best to support you and I can do my best to reflect what my struggles are as a way to demonstrate vulnerability, demonstrate asking for help. Um, and that that's really the framework that I wanna start from. I also have appreciated during COVID this idea, I don't, I don't know who said it, I'm sure some very smart person said it first, um, but that we're, we're in the same storm, but we're in different boats um, because Yes, we all are experiencing COVID, but for some of, you know, it's just very different person to person. And so when I think about supporting people and I think about the work of our organizations, one of the first kind of like worries that comes to mind for me is our folk, you know, staff who are doing direct services in their homes. And to be totally honest, one of the reasons that this comes up for me is I did that as a volunteer. I used to take the overnight crisis line shift, you know, 100 years ago. And we were able to do it at home using an answering service, and I just didn't like it. I did not like um, supporting folks in crisis in my living room. It did not work for me. And so knowing that some people have to do it that way now, um, I, I just worried about what does that feel like? What is that doing? And so I asked a couple of colleagues, and it sounds like um, for a lot of people, it's going okay. Um, and so these are just some of the ideas that I had of how we can help staff who are doing that. So um, one of the things is creating a dedicated workspace. I've already talked a lot about this as a challenge of working from home, um, but that might look like, you know, setting up some kind of like tapestry or wall. So this one area is where you're working with participants. Um, a colleague told me that the crisis line staff at her organization actually cover their phone, like some people cover their phones when their shift isn't happening. So when they're at home, they don't see the phone in their home which I thought was really nice. It's like kind of that physical reminder of separation. Um, and so those are things that like you could do. I worked with a volunteer um, who would come in for crisis sign shifts and she had this little heart shaped box um, and she would open the box and put it in front of her while she was on her shift. And one day I asked her like, what is this about? 
and she said that for her, when she was when she was doing her shift, her heart was open to the people she was helping. But when her shift was over, she was taking her heart back for herself. And I just thought that was such a beautiful example of um, of creating sort of this physical indication of what you're giving, but also remembering that it's yours and that you deserve your own care and your own breaks from this work as often as you can. So helping helping think through some of those ideas and asking people to um, brainstorm those ideas with each other. On the flip side, I had a colleague who said that um, she sent home all the office plants. So there was a bunch of plants in the office and so she gathered them in one place and staff were invited to come and pick one up. And that was her saying, you know, we're still, even though we're working independently and in different places, our organization is still what we're caring for. Um, and so care for this plant <laughs> while we're apart. And, um, and that's like your reminder of that you're part of something, you're part of an organization and of a group. So I, I thought that was pretty lovely as well. And then I think that it's really important for supervisors to just ask how it's going. Um, get ahead of uh, get ahead of any potential vicarious trauma that's popping up because of this direct service happening at home, and just let people know that you're open to talking about it. Um, asking asking them questions about it first can just help get that conversation started. And I also think that, you know, like I said, I walked into this assumption that it didn't work for, you know, it didn't work for me, so therefore it was problematic. Um, but that isn't the case for everybody. So if you're talking about it one-on-one -on -one in supervision or in staff meetings, then you're going to get people's wonderful creative ideas of what's working for them. And then we've mentioned um, kind of this in-person live conversations. And so creating things like Slack channels or, um, Chat, you know, I am chatting and anything like that, because when people are doing direct service, part of what allows us to do it, I think, is to check in with each other. And when we're in person, we can do that organically and without thinking about it. But if you're home by yourself, you might need that kind of like, oh, right, I've got my Slack channel open, I'm marked as active, I'm ready to like say, ooh, just got off a tough call, or um, I'm trying to make a safety plan and it's not going very well, can I get some ideas? Or you know, any questions you have, asking that of your coworkers as they're coming to you and not waiting can be really helpful. So next I want to talk about flexibility for parents and caregivers. And I feel like, um, in my experience, this is what's hardest right now for a lot of people. And not everybody is a parent or a caregiver. And so what's true is that um, sometimes it looks like People who aren't parenting or caregiving are picking, you know, doing more, um, or people who are parenting and caregiving are are doing things all day long for like 16 hours, just trying to get as much done as they can at weird random hours of the day. And so I think that as supervisors, um, I really encourage each of us to communicate what accommodations can be made before they have to be asked for. I've been really disappointed and shocked with how many workplaces aren't telling their, their employees about the paid leave that's available to them because of COVID. And so folks are having to figure this stuff out on their own. So I think that um, asking first, how is it going for you? I know you have a kid at home. Um, what are some of the challenges that you're dealing with? Are there things that you need? You know, just trying to get ahead of that is really, really important. And I know for myself, I also will be really forthright about what works and doesn't work for me as a parent and working at home um, and or the things that are on my mind or the struggles that I'm having. So, for example, I've been really um, transparent about the fact that my work hours have, have changed, obviously. So when school was happening in the spring, I would get on my computer by 7 a.m. and I would try to get a few hours of work in before my daughter was at school, at school. And, um, and I was working every weekend. And these are things that I did not do before because I really love my boundaries, um, but I just had to do them because of COVID. And so what I would say is, when you receive an email from me in the morning, I do not expect you to reply. <laughs> like if you have your, if you see this, you know, as you're brushing your teeth because you have it on your phone, I don't like your workday starts at a different time than my workday. I do not have the expectation. If I'm working on the weekend, if I'm working on a, on a holiday, um, I do not expect that you are doing the same. This is just what works for me as I'm balancing multiple things at home. So just being really, really forthright and 
getting ahead of that because people will pay attention. They think that if the boss is working at different hours, then they're expected to be responsive. So I want people to know that I don't have that expectation. I also want people to know that what works for me, I don't expect will work for them. So just because I'm an early bird doesn't mean that I think every parent should begin work at seven in the morning. You know, so these are just ways to say like, this is what works for me. What do you think works for you? What have you tried? Um, what worked about that or what didn't work about that? And just trying to facilitate those conversations. I also wanna talk briefly about these two resources for paid leave um, or furloughs. And I'm certainly not an HR professional, <laughs> but because I am a supervisor, and the interim ED, I kind of have to know that these things exist. And so I want to start first with the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. And I'm going to put another link in the chat box. And um, so this was passed in the spring um, and is federal paid leave because of COVID. And <clears throat> there are kind of two different levels for parents and caregivers. The first, um, and so obviously there's paid leave if someone is ill because of COVID or taking care of a family member who's ill with COVID, but there's also leave when daycare or school has been disrupted because of COVID, and the employee is paid two-thirds of their wage for this leave, so it's even better than regular family leave in the United States because you're getting paid for a part of, a part of your time. <clears throat> And the way that this works, and please somebody correct me if I'm wrong, is that um, the employer, so your organization is paying that two thirds, or is it from unemployment? I'm not, I have not had anyone use this yet in the organization I'm at. Um, so there might be some, I bring that up to say there might be some um, responsibility <laughs> that the organization holds in making sure employees are still paid even though they're not working, um, but that it's like reimbursed through uh, tax payments. So I'm sorry, I don't know that better than, than what I'm sharing with you, but the, the link will outline it. So there's two different levels of this kind of paid leave. The one is for up to 80 hours, and then the second level is up to 10 weeks. And so now that we're six months into COVID and it's fall, I definitely know some, some parents and caregivers who are like, well, I'm, I'm, I have to. <laughs> like, I made it work in the spring. I don't know how to make it work anymore. And you don't have to take... Um, your 80 hours back to back. So you might actually decide that, or an employee may decide that they wanna take every Friday off for the next two months or something. You know, So they're gonna get paid two thirds for those hours they've missed. Um, it's not like you have to take 10 weeks off of your job. You can, you can um, take it in, in pieces. Okay, thank you, Christy. Um, Christy is saying that that's correct. The employer pays them two thirds of the base rate pay and then is reimbursed. Um, okay, and then the other, the other option that came up in the, uh, there was an executive director kind of support call last week, is the shared work program. In Oregon, this is called the work share program. So that's funny. Um, so that link is in the chat box. So this is Washington State's shared work program. This is more when an uh, employee is furloughed and um, I worked at an organization that had to use this program. And so the employees have to be full time. And this is, these are Oregon rules. So I'm just sharing them as an example of what you might expect as you check out this option. So um, they have to be full time employees who are furloughed and, and at least four employees in the organization have to be furloughed. So it's not like one person can just use this. Um, though this is an employment office and so if you have to do furloughs or um, you, you decide to do furloughs because COVID continues on, then um, you would go through the actual employment department and the two thirds, again, you get paid two thirds of the base wage of your wage. Um, the, un the employment office is paying that, that dollar amount. And so the paperwork is all through the employment office, um, but the organization is, work is submitting, um, is applying for the program and making it available to employees. So if this is something that your organization either needs to do or is considered, considering doing just to have some flexibility, then that's another resource available. Okay, so moving away from supporting parents and caregivers, I'm gonna talk about just supervision in general. And um, one of the things that 
you know, I'm someone who believes that we should be having regular supervision, even if we're not in a pandemic. And so this is hopefully something that's already happening in your organization. Um, and I think that it's really critical that those, those patterns, those schedules continue on. And so making sure you're still meeting with the people you supervise. I've been um, kind of leaving it up to them around, do you wanna see faces? Do you wanna do a Zoom? Do you wanna do a phone call? If you feel comfortable, if it's something um, that you're open to, meeting in person um, outside is an option. Um, at the office I'm at, when I'm in the office, we wear, you know, we, we're following all these different COVID protocols. So we're wearing masks. If I'm meeting one-on-one -on -one with someone, it's in a large office with the windows open and with masks on. Um, but just making sure that those meetings are still happening and that you're still available for regular supervision with people. And then the other thing that I want to say is I think that, you know, as we've been just emailing each other, I mean, we're all, all getting so many more emails than we used to. Um, I think that we are like interpreting tones <laughs> and sometimes there's ambiguity in the way that you read an email and you make assumptions about what, what somebody intends or a feeling they're having. And so I think I'm trying to just pick up the phone sometimes. And again, if, if the expectation is, I know you're working today, so I'm going to be able to call you. Um, if I have something quick, like instead of sending another email about like a quick question I have, I try to just call people. Um, and they always seem surprised, <laughs> like what, what's going on? Why do you need me? Um, so I'm just quick to say, hey, I just have a quick question. I figured a phone call was easier. Um, and then that allows us to like actually talk to somebody in our day and not just be on the screen or looking at email. I also think this is something that the whole piece of like, we're only emailing each other and perhaps we're interpreting things that aren't actually happening. Um, I've said that at staff meetings and I've said like, maybe we could do this a little bit differently. Or if that's happening, if you're feeling tension because you're interpreting somebody's email a certain way, then maybe just to, um, take a moment to think, maybe that's not actually happening or maybe that's just my perception or, or interpretation and I should get clarification. Um, because I just think, you know, again, all of us are so stressed out that that tension or that conflict is bound to to fester, so I think that's really important. What other things are you all doing around supervision itself? Um, things that are working well? And remember that Michelle can um, unmute you if you would like to actually say a whole thing out loud. Are folks still having supervision? Okay, so we have a brand new supervisor supervising brand new people. So looking for ways to feel new staff feel welcome. And actually that isn't something that I included and, and would love to hear how you all are onboarding new employees. Um, because I think that is, and especially if you could maybe tell a story by being unmuted, that would be great. Um, because we have folks who are starting their jobs while working from home. And so they're not meeting their coworkers in person. And that must be really strange. So taking time to know how folks are coping and provide strategies, just really making sure to have those conversations and check in. And just staying with that routine. Yeah, I think that that's, that definitely is what comes to mind for me. Yeah, we've got someone who's having regularly check-ins and then weekly staff meetings. Um, this is on the next slide, but I think I think having actually more staff meetings is okay right now. Maybe, I mean, for us, they're shorter, but they're, they're twice a month instead of once a month, um, just so we can stay in touch better. So that, I'm gonna pause um, for a moment and talk a little bit about onboarding new employees right now and, and really just hiring, hiring and training. Um, we, you know, I've, I've just seen this work different ways. I have a, I have a friend who was, going through an interview process and didn't actually meet anyone in person until the very end of the process and 
felt um, that felt really difficult. At my um, interim position, obviously we're hiring a permanent executive director. And so we put together a very strange kind of like finalist interview where they came to the center and, you know, masks, social distancing, everyone gets their own office. So we followed all those things. We asked all the, you know, they asked the candidates to bring them to bring masks with them. So they got like a tour, they got to meet just a couple people in the building and then their interviews were still over Zoom and we were all in the offices all around the building. Um, but then obviously like other staff who weren't in the building could participate or board members. And it was really weird to be saying like, we're, you know, you've come to our organization and yet we're going to Zoom the meeting, the, the interview, um, but we couldn't all be in person because of the number of people. And when the candidate is on their own Zoom screen, we can see them and we can hear them really well, um, as opposed to they're in the conference room and the person who's at home that day can't actually even hear what the candidate is saying or talking about. So I think that um, when I think about bringing new people on, I want them to see where they would work. I want them to meet coworkers in person, but depending on the size of the hiring committee, you might find that you need to make some of those accommodations. And then in terms of um, onboarding, I would imagine, and, and I would, if anyone is onboarding somebody working from home, um, if the employee, the new employee is working from home from day one, I would love to hear how that's going. I think that we are primarily onboarding and training folks in person at the organization. And so we're just having to keep those masks on, have the windows open um, and do everything we can to be safe. Um, and that being said, I think having any kind of online, I mean, luckily Zoom allows us to do things like shared screens and whatnot. So if you're trying to train somebody on using your shared drive or your, um, your accessible online drive, then you can tell them where, where you're looking. Oh, I just turned my thing off. You can tell them what you're looking at and where. Cindy says breakfast in the park to make personal contact in a safer place. Okay, so much screen sharing, <laughs> yes, so much screen sharing. Okay, so I wanted to kind of end talking about team cohesion and I'm watching the clock. This is, um, I'm gonna end early and I apologize that I didn't drag this out longer, but, um, <laughs> uh, but it looks like I am gonna end early. So I'm just gonna say that now. I wanted to talk about team cohesion um, because if we were in person, we would be chatting in the break room or, you know, sharing treats with each other or checking in about how things are going. Um, and so I think that it's important to create opportunities to do that and to kind of try a little bit harder to create opportunities to do that. And so um, we've done happy hours over Zoom. Um, we actually are going to play bingo together over Zoom. <laughs> Um, for some self-care time, the Oregon Sexual Assault Task Force, they do a, um, I think it's monthly, they do a craft hour. And I bring this up because you can act, anyone can participate, you have to register in advance. But if you ever work with the Oregon Sexual Assault Task Force and want to hang out with them and do crafts things, what they found is that um, rather than kind of trying to create something that they would all share, that if it was just like a bring what you're working on and hang out together, it was just kind of a different vibe. And as somebody who loves a craft but doesn't really do any crafts, I'd probably like bring coloring. You know, like it doesn't have to be, I wouldn't probably overthink it. Um, another option is during staff meetings to have breakout room time where people who don't typically talk to each other because their tasks, you know, don't align, can just check in with each other that way. I think that if you're going to do that, you could perhaps create some um, structure around what's happening in those breakout rooms. It might be just easy that folks are hanging out um, or you might like let somebody draw names of who's in what room or, you know, you might just let it be random. Um, but just giving people time to talk and share in a way that um, is a little bit more one on one than you would do during the staff meeting. And then if you're able to, depending on, on your organization location, um, being outside together, um, this is something that we've done a few times. We have a little back patio and lawn, um, but if there's parks close by or um, areas that you can come together, that just allows you to be in person and you can maintain social distancing and 
when, when we've done it, it's been everyone bring your own chair. And um, we had this whole, we had like a, we tried to have a picnic, but then people were had different comfort zones around sharing food. So we only um, bought food that was individually wrapped. And, you know, we just tried to accommodate people's different comfort zones. And, and honestly, we started by saying, we're going to have a picnic outside on this day and we're going to cater it. And then I had a couple people say, like, I actually don't really want to eat food that everyone's, you know, serving themselves. And I had done some research um, that told me that that was an okay thing to do, but individuals weren't going to do it or didn't feel comfortable. So really just being, being flexible, changing your plan because you want to stick with what people feel comfortable with. The one thing that um, feels difficult for me is that you know, I'm not a medical professional and yet I'm trying to decipher what I'm reading on like the CDC website or the World Health Organization um, around things like sharing food or whatnot. And um, sometimes I just want someone else to tell me exactly what to do. So do your best research, recognize what you don't know, and then ask how, how comfortable people feel. The other thing that, um, that we did at the organization I'm, I'm at is when COVID began and we all started to work from home is we actually created a Facebook group. And like many Facebook groups, it was very active at first and very quiet now, but it was just a way to um, share like, here's, here's my camping trip or like, here's how my garden's looking. Um, just to kind of like funny memes, funny jokes, um, just as a way to do some of the things that we couldn't do in person anymore socially or, or one, you know, person to person. Um, and I've learned a lot more about my coworkers than I did before because I get to see these little windows into their lives and it's been really nice. Um, so it's been just a good option there. And then I've already mentioned this, but in actually increasing staff meetings um, so that people can communicate in real time and just trying to keep it maybe shorter, um, accommodating for our Zoom fatigue as much as possible and just recognizing when people kind of need to take some limits. So this is my last slide. I'm ending with this lovely quote by your Daily Ward. If you're tired, and you might indeed be tired or getting there, remember the infinite moving parts that hold you up without asking you to show them how. It took a miracle to make you in the first place, and from hour to hour you go on being made. I just really, I love this quote anyway. I love this poet. Um, but I wanted to put that here because we are so tired, and there's so many things to feel worried about right now. Um, and we are going, we're still doing it, we're still making it happen. And um, sometimes being able to do that is trusting, trusting our capacity as individual people, definitely trusting our capacity as, as advocates, as supervisors, as organizations, and doing our best and, and being really forthright about what's working or not working for us or for one another, so that we can um, just keep supporting each other as best as possible. So since I've ended early, um, I wanted to give folks a chance to chime in if there was something that you didn't hear about that you'd love to spend some time with before 1130.